and we are here with five UK sitcoms that were remade in the USA. Number one, Agony, a British sitcom on ITV screens from 1979 to 1981. It's a blend of humour and heart-wrenching realism, apparently. At its core, the show revolves around the life of Jane Lucas, portrayed by a talented Maureen Lipman. Jane is not your typical protagonist. She's a highly successful agony aunt, doling out advice on a radio call-in show and crafting the beloved Dear Jane column for Person magazine. However, her professional triumphs stand in stark contrast to her personal life, which is an unmitigated disaster. With a genteel husband, Lawrence, who's emotionally inept, and a meddlesome Jewish mother, B, constantly interfering, Jane's own relationships are in a shambles. Her friends, including the witty Val, her boss Diana, and her neighbours Rob and Michael, all confide their problems to her. Nigel Hamster's column that you and your psychiatrist husband are not speaking. Is that true? I don't know. I'll ask him. <laughs> Let me ask you, how does a marriage mender mend her own marriage? I keep thinking so of Lawrence having a great you? time with a different girl each night and me sitting at home with two gay boys. Nothing personal. No. <laughs> Here, try one of my new health cigarettes, Jane. They're packed with vitamin B37. Very good for your sex drive. Oh, that's all I need. I've got the answer. Damn, Jane. We all know what you've been going through since Lawrence left you. But I don't know what you mean. The answers you've been writing to people's problems are very revealing. Now, this one was remade in the US as The Lucy Arnaz Show, a very short-lived CBS network sitcom with Lucy Arnaz at the helm, daughter of Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz. Debuted on April the 2nd, 1985, it burst onto the scene only to be yanked from the airwaves after a mere four episodes, leaving audiences wanting more. Fortunately, the show's creators granted this wish and they did air the remaining two episodes in 1985. The heart of the series revolves around psychologist Dr Jane Lucas, brilliantly brought to life by Lucy Arnaz. Jane's world unfolds as she plays the role of an advice guru, taking on public inquiries through her radio show named The Jane Lucas Show and within the pages of a magazine, all very similar of course. This is CBS. Ready to take your call. Thank you, Larry. Some thoughts about men who refuse to grow up. Pot bellied, beer guzzling, cigar chomping spectators to life. The ones you can find under any table in town. <laughs> I'd like to talk to you about the Vic Rossettis of this world. Number two, Dad's Army, a cherished British television sitcom which offers an endearing glimpse into the United Kingdom's home guard during the tumultuous era of the Second World War. Crafted by Jimmy Perry and David Croft, the series originally was on screen from 1968 until 1977, which was an impressive nine-season journey comprising of a total of 80 episodes. The show's enduring legacy extends beyond the small screen with a feature film released in 71 and a successful stage production and further radio adaptation faithful to the television scripts. The series regards the Home Guard, a motley crew of local volunteers who were otherwise ineligible for military service owing to factors like age or medical reasons or exempt professions from conscription. These resilient individuals, most of them past their military prime, become the endearing characters that populate dad. Dad's Army. Now it's classic comedy as we join the aspiring film stars of Dad's Army. Cause who do you think you are giving Mr. Hitler? I tell you, Wilson, they're a nation of automatons, led by a lunatic who looks like Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> your name will go on the list. Hitler is a twerp. Your name will also go on the list. <laughs> what is it? Don't tell him, Pike. Pike. <laughs> The USA version of this was titled The Rear Guard and was a 1976 
pilot episode that attempted to adapt the British situation comedy Dad's Army for American audiences. The show was set against the backdrop of World War II, focusing on a group of men within the American Civil Defence in 1942 who comprised an auxiliary force prepared for the event of a potential invasion of the United States. The pilot episode was adapted from the original British series, specifically the Deadly Attachment episode, where a German U-boat crew is placed under the supervision of the platoon. The American Broadcasting Company aired the pilot in 76, and despite its ambitions, the rear guard did not receive a green light for a full series, and the original tapes were subsequently apparently erased. We know our finest men are off to fight the war. Those at home are drilling at the trips. You're not going to win this war. Oh, yes, we are. Oh, no, yeah. Oh, not. yes, we are. Adolf Hitler is a jerk. He's nothing but a Nazi. Your name will also go on the list. <laughs> what is it? Don't tell him, Henderson. Henderson, thank you. Sir. Number three, Dear John a British sitcom written by John Sullivan, and it made its mark with two series and a special that graced television screens in 86 and 87. The sitcom's title takes inspiration from Dear John letters, typically penned by women to conclude their relationships, and aptly, the series opens with John discovering that his wife is leaving him for a friend. This heartbreaking revelation forces him out of his home, all while he's still saddled with the burden of the mortgage. In search of a new place to stay, John stumbles into the one-to-one singles club, where he encounters a motley crew of individuals who, like him, have experienced unfortunate turns in their romantic lives. New at 830 Dear John, and the membership's grown down at the one to one. Dear John. Dear John. for 12 years to my husband <laughs> and we all lived in Sudbury <laughs> till I went upstairs to our bedroom the curtains had been drawn so it was rather dark I noticed there was a woman sitting at my dressing table putting on makeup it was George, wearing an Afro wig and my clothes! <laughs> and over there, this was titled, uh, well, Dear John, surprisingly, an American sitcom that aired on NBC from October 6th, 88 to July 22nd, 92, finding its inspiration, of course, in the British sitcom of the same name. When shown in the United Kingdom, it was retitled Dear John USA to avoid confusing us Brits. The series underwent several shifts in time slots during its four season run bouncing between Wednesdays, Thursdays Fridays, sometimes Saturday nights notably it transitioned from a post cheers slot on Thursdays to a post night court slot on Wednesdays in 1990 it was set in the bustling backdrop of New York City and it starred Judd Hirsch as John Lacey a teacher at a Manhattan primary school and after a decade of marriage John's life takes a tumultuous turn when he arrives home one day to discover a dear John letter from his wife Wednesday Wendy, who's leaving him for his best friend. The divorce court awards Wendy the house and custody of their son Matthew, forcing John to relocate to an apartment in the Rigo Park neighbourhood of Queens. So, John, how do you like your new bachelor pad? Not very cheerful. <laughs> what did I tell you, Gloria? I'll help you fix it up. Oh, thanks, thanks, sir. Uh, now, John, I... I hope it goes without saying. The last thing I want to do is interfere in your life. Well, I appreciate but it, But I saw sincerely. this ad in the paper. <laughs> oh, gosh. I, I don't seem to have you on my list. Oh, well, no problem. My name is Faye. I'm the organizer of the group. Oh, nice to meet you. Number four, the fall and rise of Reginald Perrin. This one is a quintessentially British sitcom featuring the exceptional Leonard Rossiter in the title role. It ran from 1976 to 1979 and it's an adaptation of novels penned by David Nobbs. The original screenplay for the first series was adapted from the first novel, however certain subplots within the series, deemed a little too dark or risque for television, underwent adjustments or were 
excluded. The storyline revolves around Reginald Reggie Perrin, a middle-aged middle manager. His age is disclosed as 46 in the first series. He spirals into bizarre and unconventional behaviour, fuelled by the perceived pointlessness of his job at Sunshine Desserts, in contrast to other sitcoms of its era, which were often centred on mundane and middle-class suburban family life. The fall and rise of Reginald Perrin stands as much more subversive content. There were three television series in total, all under the same title, which were broadcast between 76 and 79. There was a fourth instalment titled The Legacy of Reginald Perrin, in 96, which was essentially a remake or rehash of the thing. In November 2020, a fresh dramatisation of the novels was broadcast on BBC Radio 4 as well. This is BBC Scotland. As a special tribute to the television comedy star Leonard Rossiter, who died just over a week ago, we're now showing an episode first seen in 1977 from the successful BBC series The Fall and Rise of Reginald Perrin. Next month I open my new shop, Grot. Grot? Yes, Grot. <laughs> and what are you going to sell in this new shop, Grot? Rubbish. What, what, what do you think? What do you think this is? A grotty shop called Grot. Can I help you, madam? Just looking. Yes, certainly. It's all rubbish. Yes, absolutely complete and utter rubbish. <laughs> Everything in this shop is rubbish, is it? Absolutely, sir. This wine, uh, useless, is it? Absolutely revolting. Mm. <laughs> um, that's really revolting, is it? Have you ever tasted weasel spit strain through a mold of <laughs> And our US counterpart was titled Reggie. This American sitcom was on ABC, only briefly, running from August the 4th until September the 1st in 1983, and of course drew its inspiration from the fall and rise of Reginald Perrin. This series delves into the life of Reggie Potter, a middle-aged individual grappling with concerns about work and home life. Amidst his daily struggles, Reggie is also known to indulge in sexual fantasies involving a co-worker. Reggie offers a glimpse into the comedic escapades and day-to-day -day tribulations of its titular character, creating humorous viewing experience for its audience. This is ABC. I'd like to be in the Virgin Islands Watching the sea And number five, Faulty Towers. This one's a beloved British television sitcom that was written by John Cleese, of course, and his partner Connie Booth. The show originally aired on BBC Two in two series, 1975 and later 1979. It's celebrated as one of the greatest British television programmes ever, holding various top spots in various polls and it's the best this and the best that. Set within the confines of Faulty Towers, a fictional hotel in the picturesque English seaside town of Torquay in Devon, the series revolves around the irritable, rude and beleaguered owner Basil Faulty, brought to life by John Cleese. The inception of Faulty Towers can be traced back to John Cleese's stay at the Glen Eagles Hotel in Torquay, Devon in 1970, where he crossed paths with the eccentric hotel owner Donald Sinclair. Sinclair's stuffy and snobbish demeanour, along with his attitude of treating guests as mere inconveniences inspired Cleese to craft the character of Basil Faulty. Here on one we enter the madcap world of Faulty Towers. Good morning madam, can I help you? Are you the manager? I am the owner madam. I want to speak to the manager. I am the manager too. What? What? I'm the manager. Yes I know, you've just told me. What's the matter with you? I asked for a room with a view. Deaf, mad and blind. I expect to be able to see the sea. You can see the sea. It's over there between the land and the sky. <laughs> And over in the US, this one was repackaged as Amanda's, also known as Amanda by the Sea. It was an American sitcom television series that was on screen on ABC from February the 10th to May 26th, 1983. It was based on, of course, Faulty Towers, and this one starred B. Arthur. This series marked B. Arthur's return to series television following the conclusion of her iconic sitcom Maud, back in 78. The formidable Amanda Cartwright, portrayed by B. Arthur, serves as the central character of the show. She takes on the role of the owner of Amanda's by the Sea, a struggling California seaside hotel that offers breathtaking 
breathtaking views of the Pacific Ocean. The comedy in Amanda's revolves around a series of comical mishaps, of course, including burnt steaks, fussy guests and the pressure of impressing travel guide writers, the ever-looming threat of foreclosure by Mr Monday and the humorous attempts of brother-in-law Zack as he endeavours to win over Amanda. In total, 13 episodes of the series were produced, with three remaining unaired due to the series' cancellation. you're going to enjoy your stay. I doubt it. We usually stay at first-rate hotels. <laughs> first-rate hotels. 101 is our quietest room. You're absolutely sure. Would you like me to write it in blood? <laughs> Aldo! Aldo, please, take our charming and distinguished guests up to room 102. Okay. All I can see out of my window is trees. But what did you expect to see out of a window in California? The Eiffel Tower? <laughs> To see Mrs. Cartwright is a view of the ocean. Oh, well, maybe you didn't notice it. It's that big blue thing between the land and the sky. I know what it looks like. And there you have it. That's five British sitcoms that were remade, repackaged, or re whatevered over in the US. Did I miss any out? You let me know in the comments below. Like this video and share it with your friends and subscribe to the channel so that you'll always know when I've uploaded another one. It's all that good YouTube stuff. Bye for now.